Good morning. Good morning. We are so excited that you are here today if you are an invited guest. And so on behalf of uh, the church family here, let me thank you. You don't know what it means to us uh, to reach out to someone, family, friend, or neighbor, and have them uh, take us up on that invitation and come and worship God together. These days, these times like this morning, these are special. And uh, I know we have a number of people watching remotely uh, on our live stream, those who are not able to be here, but they're, they're with us, uh, they're watching, they're seeing, they're worshiping, and uh, we appreciate those folks as well. So um, it's good to come and, and be at the foot of our God and our Creator and honor Him and think about Him, and so we do that together today. Uh, when I was seven years old in the second grade, uh, there was a, a classmate, his name was J.W., and he was the fastest kid in our class. And I remember noticing that uh, it wasn't long before I noticed the shoes that he wore, and I wanted shoes like that. And you can understand my logic. Uh, and I understand that they weren't even, I, 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 rem, I don't even think they were name brand or any great uh, a pair of shoes, but all I knew was that kid's fast, I'm slow, and uh, if I had his shoes, maybe I'd be fast. That was my logic, okay? It was flawed logic, but nevertheless, you understand my logic. Imagine if uh, you're deciding what motor oil to put in your vehicle, and you, you came to realize, uh, imagine this were true, that 9 out of 10 mechanics used a certain type of motor oil in their own vehicles. 9 out of 10 used, you know, make up a name of motor oil, uh, you know, Jimmy Ray's motor oil, but 9 out of 10 mechanics used it in their own vehicle. Well, if you're very smart at all, you would think, hmm, maybe I ought to use that same motor oil. They ought to know. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. In verse 28, we're going to look at uh, a story here of Jesus in Luke chapter 9 with his disciples. Peter, James, and John. And we notice that in verse 28, Luke 9, 28, Scripture says that about eight days after these saints, He took with Him Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And my point of, of, of all this about, uh, you know, what motor oil would you use, my, my point is Jesus prayed often. Jesus prayed often. Often, And here's another occasion where he takes his uh, Peter, James, and John, these three apostles, and he prayed. How is your prayer life? If the divine Jesus Christ needed to rely on the strength of the Father through prayer, how much do you think you need? How much do you think I need? We need prayer more than we realize. There is so much help available to us through prayer if we would give more time to it. There is so much closeness with God we could enjoy if we would spend more time with Him in prayer. So, verse 29, As He was praying, the appearance of His face was altered and His clothing, clothing became dazzling white. Uh, this, of course, is the transfiguration. And notice that His Clothing became bright white. The Gospel of Matthew records this and says his face shone like the sun. Uh, Jesus was very bright. He was transfigured. Okay, I don't have full understanding of what all that was about. All I know is he was, he was in a glorious state. One I imagine much more like uh, he will be and we will notice and we will be in heaven. More heavenly he was in that state. But... But notice that this happens as he was praying. And there's another occasion where something pretty special happened as Jesus was praying. Um, and it's in Luke chapter 3, verse 21. This was where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And it says, when Jesus also had been baptized. So he's, he's come up out of the water. He has been baptized and he was praying. And that's when the heavens opened. The dove came down. The Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came down. And that's when the voice of God said, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Amen. I love that. I mean, that's a powerful moment, isn't it? When the Father says that about the Son. And He says it as Jesus was praying. 
Do you like it when people are pleased with you? Do you like it when people are, are proud of you? Uh, that's kind of a human condition. We all like that. We like people to be proud of us. Uh, but however, I would point out that most of us spend way too much time and energy trying to impress someone. Don't you think? Way too much time and energy trying to impress someone. Maybe we're, we're trying to in, in, impress, uh, as an adult, you might still be after a parent's approval uh, or the approval of a coworker, or to impress a boss or uh, maybe a certain boy or girl you have a crush on or just people in general. Uh, we, we want to impress people. And I would say there's a, an epidemic on social media of posting things, including just a, a photo of our own self. And I'm not saying everyone, I'm not saying that you're always doing this when you do it. I'm saying there's an epidemic of this, this idea of, you know, is anyone pleased with me? How many people liked my selfie? We live too much of our lives trying to impress people, don't we? But the one you really need to be proud of you is God Almighty. Amen. That's the one, right? Amen. Because He is your Creator. He is your Redeemer. He will be your judge at the end of time. He's the one we need to please. Amen. And so this picture here of Jesus and God being pleased with Him, that's what we all want. Isn't it? That's what we need to strive for. So back to our passage, uh, verse 30. So Jesus is transfigured in verse 30 says, Behold, two men were talking with him. So all of a sudden, two men show up with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So they go up on this mountain to pray. And while Jesus was praying, all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah show up. And they also have a different appearance. Although the scripture doesn't describe it quite like it does Jesus. But Moses and Elijah show up while Jesus is praying. And there's a lot about this story we don't know. And so uh, I, there are things I wonder. For example, I wonder if Moses and Elijah being here is an answer to Jesus' prayer. All we know is Jesus is praying and here come Moses and Elijah. It's unusual. Um, and, and we wonder what, what were they there for? Well, here's what we know. They were talking with Jesus. And as you read this story and you study this in other Gospels, you see that Moses and Elijah really didn't do much with Peter, James, and John. In fact, at this point, Peter, James, and John are sleeping right now. We'll see that in a minute as we read on. They are asleep. Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah. And I wonder if they were encouraging Jesus. What we know is they were speaking about his departure and what he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. What is that? Well, Jesus is he's going to die at Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where prophets go to die. Uh, Jerusalem is where Jesus was to die. That was his, his mission was to die on the cross. That's what he was to accomplish. And that is what they're talking about. And following that will be his departure back to heaven. And I wonder... If Elijah and Moses are there encouraging Jesus. Why did God not send angels to Jesus at this point? We have other occasions where God did that. Uh, remember when Jesus fasted in the desert 40 days and then the devil tempted him three times. And after the devil's temptation, the Bible says that God sent angels and they, they strengthened Jesus. They ministered to him. <coughs> In the Garden of Gethsemane, remember when Jesus was praying, he prayed, God, please let this cup pass. He prayed a second time, please let this cup pass. And then God sends an angel who strengthens him, comforts him. I wonder why God didn't send an angel here. And maybe it's because Moses and Elijah, they can understand. They can relate. Now, now bear with me. We don't know why. But, but think about this. An angel doesn't understand what it's like to be rejected by God's people. An angel doesn't understand what it's like to have God's people, the ones you're trying... You're just a messenger of God. You're trying to lead them and they turn on you and they want to kill you and they do. And that's what they did to Jesus. Moses understood that. His followers wanted to stone him. Elijah understood that. God's people tried to kill him. These two that didn't even live in the same time period, Moses and Elijah, are sent and they talk to Jesus about his departure and what he's about to accomplish. One thing we know 
When a person is struggling, it is, an, it is especially helpful for someone to encourage them who's been there. Uh, our, our church family here, we have, uh, we've had a tough week because we lost one of our young men uh, this past week and had his service yesterday. And it, it, it's been trying. It's, it's hard on us. And uh, in the midst of all of that, uh, I love, uh, incidentally, I, I want to tell you, Larry, we, we, our hearts have, have poured out to Larry, our brother, who's lost his grandson. And uh, Larry Mattingly has said uh, uh, numerous times that the love of this church family has been more than he can express words to. And I love it. But I especially love the fact that this past week, just kind of watching uh, how we've gone along as a church family, I, I loved seeing Karen Cotting reach out to Larry in a special way to comfort him. And I love that. Because I, I would imagine all the expressions of love to him are valuable to him. But... Here's one who knows what it's like to lose a child. And that is special. When you comfort someone with a hurt that you have hurt and you have had that same hurt, it means something. And what I want you to know today is whatever hurts you have in your past, whatever scars you have in your past, whether they're self-inflicted, whether they were out of your control, whatever scars you have, guess what? God wants to use that to help someone else. He wants to use that to comfort someone else. Uh, I, I got a text from a guy earlier this week. He, he's been struggling with alcohol. Uh, he texted me. He said, I've been so many days sober and life's going better. My marriage is going better. And, and I praise God. Uh, you know, he wanted to let me know that. And uh, I appreciate that. But I'll tell you, you know who would be the greatest uh, human comfort to a guy going through something like that with that challenge is someone who's struggled with alcohol in the past. You need to know when you look at a, a, a church family, if you ever if anyone here has walked in the doors today and you thought, "Boy, you know, this is okay, but I don't know that I really belong here." Everyone in this room and everyone listening needs to know you belong in God's church family because we are all flawed, we all have scars, we all have had hurts, and we use that to comfort each other. And we honor God in doing that. Uh, in fact, we have a ladies' class right now. I love it. We have a ladies' class meets in this room Sunday mornings. And each week, a different lady tells her story of her scars. I love it. Uh, that's how God always wanted us to be. So Elijah and Moses are here, and they are talking to Jesus. And uh, we, don't know, we don't know all about that, but we know they were speaking about his departure and his mission. And then here's what happens. Verse 32. Uh, Peter and those who were with him, as Peter, James, and John, heavy with sleep. <laughs> These guys are sleeping. I don't know if they got tired. You know, they went up on the mountain, um, high up on the mountain, a tall mountain, one of the Gospels says. And these guys, maybe they're wore out, but they're, they're sleeping. And in the midst of them sleeping, look at what they're missing. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, transfigured. Moses, the lawgiver. And Elijah, the prophet. These three are all together, these giants, right? And of course, Jesus is, as we know, this story shows us. I say we say them together, but Jesus Christ is God Almighty as well. He's divine. Nevertheless, Peter, James, and John, they're missing this because they're sleeping. When they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. It reminds me how distracted we are as people. How distracted we are. Uh, I, I'm a person who enjoys sports. I always have. I don't know where I picked it up, where it started. I enjoyed following. I started following OU. Uh, I, would, I would follow basketball, Sooner basketball, football as a, as a kid. And uh, I didn't pick it up for my dad or, or an uncle or brother or anyone. I just, I just did. And I always have. I've always enjoyed that. Uh, but I wonder sometimes the things that we get so excited about and we follow, I, I wonder how that looks to God. And I might have got a glimpse of it here a while back. I was watching TV and flipping channels. And it was on the ESPN. And ESPN was broadcasting a cornhole championship. Okay? If you don't know what cornhole is, 
It's this game you've probably seen people playing with this board that's on an incline and a circle in it. And they have two of them. And folks are tossing bean bags to this thing and the bag slides up the board and you hope it goes in the hole. And you keep, it's kind of like a lazy man's horseshoes. You, know? <laughs> you don't even need a hammer. You don't even need to you know, mess with horseshoes. Now we're just tossing bean bags. Anyway, I'm watching this. This is on ESPN, okay? And, I, and I'm, I'm thinking, at first I'm like, this has got to be a spoof. This is, there, this is something to this. There, there's there's got to be more than what I'm seeing. But there was not. As I listen, the broadcasters are talking about this, con this, this contestant and, and this, this, you know, I don't even know what they call them. They're not athletes, but, you know, this one, he uses these kind of bags. Watch his technique. Now, he has more of this kind of technique, and they're so serious about this. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I wonder sometimes with all the things that fascinate us and all the things that take our time. And, and I'm not saying there's not a time and a place for things. I'm talking about all the things that delight us. That don't mean anything. And it, it reminds me that we would be wise to separate everything in our life into two categories. One category is this will not make a difference at all in a hundred years. It, it won't. It won't mean a, a pile of beans. I mean, it, it will be. It won't do. It won't be anything in a hundred years. It won't matter at all. And this category is what this has some eternal significance. This will matter. There are things we did this week with lose with uh, you know we lost uh, one of ours, a young brother, and we comforted the family and all, and all of that. That's eternal. Those are eternal things. Uh, there are things that you did this weekend that I would imagine had some eternal significance. And being right here absolutely does. So much of what we do, it, it, it just it's just fluff for this life, and it's all going to be burned up someday, and it's all going to be uh, forgotten. But what is eternal? Verse 33, as the men were parting from him. So Elijah and Moses, they're leaving. And Peter, he speaks up. He says, Master, it's, it's good that we're here. <laughs> when I read that, I laugh. It's like Peter saying, Jesus, this is awesome. I mean, I'm glad you invited us. It's good. That we're, this, is, this is good stuff, Jesus. I tell you what, I have an idea. Let us make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not knowing what to say. Uh, another gospel says that uh, Peter, he didn't know what to say, but he said this. If you've ever been a person that feels like, you know, you just have to fill the dead air space, that if nobody's talking, somebody ought to be talking, I'll say something. I don't know what to say, but I'll say something. You know, that's a personality thing. And, and Peter was like you. But we've all had that time where we blurted something out and we thought, oh, I wish I could rewind just a minute and not say that. Don't you think Peter had that? Because <laughs> as Peter is saying this, a cloud comes in. In verse 35, a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. In other words, God Almighty said, Hey, listen. Listen up. Quit saying dumb stuff. You don't know what you're saying. There's one to listen to, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. And it reminds me who we listen to. Who does our society listen to? Think about this. We listen to athletes. We listen to famous people. We listen to actors and actresses. It always amazes me during a political season when famous people will speak about politics, and I think... I no more want to hear what you think about politics than I do my, my favorite athlete about brain surgery. These things don't go together. Like, you're well known, but that doesn't mean your opinion means anything. So many people are talking, and in our world, it's like the blind leading the blind. It's like idiots listening to idiots. Right? Let's be honest with ourselves. And God is saying, even at a place where... Now think about this. Moses and Elijah are... These are, these are men to be um, respected. These are godly men we read about in Scripture. And, and we can see 
and follow their example how they honored God, but they were just like us. Jesus is part of the Trinity. He's the Creator. He's our Savior. We listen to Him. It is said that teenagers listen more to their peers than they listen to their parents. I remember uh, learning about that as a youth minister, as a young youth minister before I had children. And I, I learned that, you know, teenagers, they, you know, they feel like their parents are old and out of date and, and out of touch. And they listen more to their peers than they do their parents. I've always remembered that. Uh, as a parent, of course, that's frightening. As a parent of teenagers, you can imagine how frightening that is. But I can remember being a teen... Uh, I'll never forget this one day at my friend's uh, house. He and I are hanging out. We were doing different things. Uh, but then it, it just kind of got, there was a lull in the conversation. And I remember out of the blue, I'll never forget, <clears throat> we're about 14 years old. And he says, very seriously, do you ever think about girls? <laughs> And I thought, I didn't have to think. I remember having a very quick reaction internally. I, I, I thought, you know, do cows eat grass? Uh, is the sky blue? Does the sun rise in the east? Is, is fire hot? Is water wet? Yes, I think about girls. All the time. That's all I do is to think about girls. So we, we talk about, about girls. And guess what? You know, listening to each other, teenagers, guess what? We didn't know a thing about girls. We didn't, we did not. We did not know how to talk to them. We didn't know how to date one. We just knew we liked them. Okay? Young people, if your parents are dumb and out, out, out of touch like my kids' parents are, young people, they're probably not near as dumb as they seem. But young people, listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Your parents are there to guide you and, and our job as, as children is to obey our parents. But this goes for all of us. You imagine, you imagine two 14-year-old boys talking about girls. They don't know anything. But guess what? Neither do all of us. And, and, and neither, according to God, was Moses that important or Elijah that important. They weren't there for Peter, James, and John. They were there for Jesus. And listen to Him. That's the message. Listen to Him. Uh, this sermon is a reminder that you probably have a lot going on in your life. You probably have dreams and hopes and doubts and worries. And you probably have obligations and commitments. But there is one thing that we would be wise to do, and that is listen to Jesus. We have one Creator and Savior. We have one who died for us, and that is Jesus Christ. That's the one we should want to be like. We should want to listen to. We should long to talk to. One voice. We're going to have an invitation song uh, this morning, Faithful Love. We have a faithful God. And thank goodness we do. And thank goodness we have His Word to follow. Uh, if you're here this morning, we offer these invitations for uh, anyone who has something heavy on their heart that we could lift up to God and pray for you about. If there's anyone here this morning and you've been struggling with your life and your eternal soul and you know you're not saved, you've never put Christ on in baptism, you've never given your life to Christ, we would love to take time right now and help you with that. If there's anything we can help you with, please come while we stand and sing. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn covered crown makes me whole, saves me soul, washes wider than snow. Faithful love comes each fear, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can. Stand on my own. Faithful love from above came to earth to show the Father's love. And I'll never be the same for I've seen faithful love. Face to face, and 
Jesus is his name. 